Eric Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Jason Flores Williams. He's a noted civil rights attorney and author who has litigated some of the most important cases of our time. He's been featured on CNN, the New York Times, Washington Post, and has given speeches about resistance to audiences around the world. The law firm of Jason Flores Williams, along with the aid of Deep Green Resistance, has filed one of the first federal lawsuits asking the court to declare that nature has fundamental rights and standing. The lawsuit is based on the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund's work in seeking natural and community rights in Ecuador, Colombia, and, Indi- and India. So we talked last week about the case, and this week we're going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the objections that will come up to this case. Um, so first, can you do? Can you spend five or ten minutes um, reintroducing people who may not have heard last week's show to to the case we're talking about? Sure. <clears throat> so here's the problem uh, that we're trying to address with this lawsuit: is corporations obviously have tons of money, tons of resources, you know, an infinite war chest to manipulate uh, the legal system and do whatever they want and. Uh, deemed necessary to uh, make their shareholders happy, which is, you know, profits. Nature, on the other hand, on which all of human life depends, and uh, from whence the corporations uh, take all kinds of resources to turn into profit, has no rights. It has nothing. It has no way of defending itself. So what we're doing with this suit is equaling the playing field. The suit is going to confer upon nature something like rights. So in this suit, it's going to be the Colorado River. So that this is where it gets a little legal and not not really that interesting, but to sum it up, is that for someone to bring a lawsuit into the federal courts, what they have to do is uh, have standing. So they have, and standing requires a direct injury to them. All right. And they also have to have personhood that is recognized by the courts. And so nature, Colorado River, the natural entities on which we depend, has no recognized personhood or standing. So it's a lot, if you want to make this analogy, very similar to slavery, uh, where uh, you had human beings who had no rights. And we're treated as property. And nature is also treated as property in this way. And so <clears throat> what we're doing, and this example exists throughout our law in situations where an entity or an individual, say like a kid, could not go into court and litigate a lawsuit on their behalf. So they have something like guardian ad litems or, you know, in the, in the trusts uh, arena, you have ex- executors and business, you have fiduciaries, people who are legally entitled to litigate and represent the interests of another. Well, it's going to be the same kind of relationship we want to have for nature so that the Colorado River uh, and other natural entities um, will be able to be represented and bring litigation and colorable claims in court because they will henceforth, if this lawsuit is successful, have standing. And by having standing, that means that we, we're in a kind of, which would be a kind of personhood, um, for lack of a better term. And, you know, we have to deal with the terms that are currently available, available to us right now in our jurisprudence. And so we say things like personhood. So they don't have, it won't have to show the river, mountains, uh, Pachamama, as it's called in Ecuador, the Ganges, as it's called in India. You know, uh, these entities, which are so vital, <clears throat> and so dynamic, and on which we all depend, and which we can't exist without, they will not have to show injury to human beings to have colorable claims in court, which is an interesting way of saying that we recognize damage and injury to nature as deprivations and insults unto themselves, which is to say that we recognize that the natural world on which we depend and in our best times are integrated with, with has its own rights and dignity. So, so everything you're saying makes, makes perfect sense to me. Um, I, I live in an extremely conservative area. Some, I, I sometimes call it Mississippi on the north coast of California. 
<laughs> very strong sort of anti-environmental ethos here. And I can just hear some of the local people saying, so, so what? You, what if I want to fish? So I got to ask permission and um, I got to sue somebody in order to fish? What's the, what if somebody wants to fish from the river? What's, what's, what happens then? If someone wants to fish from the river? Yeah. Do I have to ask well, permission? I, I think, I, I think what you're saying, if I, if I may. Mm-hmm. Please. I, I think what you're saying, I think what you're saying is that there is going to be these common sorts of critiques regarding uh, this suit and seeking uh, standing and rights for nature. And that'll, and all, what all of those critiques come from, Derek, is the view, and this is similar to slaves, that nature is property that is ownable and is owned, and that human beings have the right to do whatever they want to to it. So with that, so my response to that, uh, there are numerous responses to it. And to, on one level, I have the response that says, well, you do realize that, you know, injuries to nature and treating nature as though it was completely and utterly your play thing, that you can do whatever to you want, whatever you want to it, that you can exploit, that you can damage, that you can fish in whenever you want, that you can take out of whatever you want in any way that you want. You realize that by doing that unchecked, ultimately, is you do do damage to human beings. Uh, that we've discussed in our last uh, conversation was that there is the Colorado River, which is becoming smaller and smaller all the time and is heading toward its own extinction. And with the extinction of the Colorado come the extinction, extinction of all the biological entities and the ecosystems that are integrated and dependent on it, is that because of the way we view nature as a piece of property, be, the property to be done with as we wish, I, the current demands on the Colorado are more than 100%, in fact, 120% of what the Colorado River can actually provide. And these demands are made by all the various states and the uh, agricultural and urban demands that they're making on it. So when you have a river upon which life is dependent that is being drained into extinction and you have cities that are dependent on it, then, you know, then it gets real simple. You can't drain the river because if you drain the river, it'll hurt you. And I think that's the American way, really, is you got to explain to people how it's going to hurt them, how it's going to do damage to them. Uh, people just don't see them. I think we just saw this with Harvey, is that, you know, you had a city that was just no regulation, abject growth, no consideration for nature. But then when, they, when it came time and when Harvey came along, what happened was that they were reminded in a very direct and personal way that they are dependent on this planet. And if they don't act in accordance and with respect for it and try to integrate with it rather than dominate it, then horrific things can happen. Now, that is the way that a lot and most of Americans need to understand what we're doing. It's going to hurt you. Unless we unless we balance the playing field, it's going to result in damage to you. So... So I was asking sort of sarcastically as a right wing person here, but now let's, I mean, part of, part of the purpose of law is to, is to make definitions. You know, you can park your car here, but if there is a bus stop, you can't park your car there. Mm-hmm. You, you can uh, withdraw money from the bank if you have a bank account there, but if you don't have a bank account there, um, robbing, taking money from the bank is called theft. So it's all about definitions. So, so now, instead of me being sarcastic, it's it's real. So what, for what, per, where do we define the distinction as to when, as to when someone would have to, um, uh, face a lawsuit if they are. I mean, I, I don't think you and I are worried about two eight-year-olds going down and fishing from the Colorado River. And in fact, if the Colorado River had fish in it, I mean, where it had water in it, they could fish better. But but yep. where where are we making that? Do you see the question? Where is the distinction as to when? Well, okay, well, let's so as I said earlier, uh, it, this is about you know balancing or equaling the playing field, and it, the kind of degradation and the kind of destruction of nature that you know concerns us, and that is to use a now common term, un, common term, unsustainable 
is or, or the, is the exploitation of nature that is coming from multinational corporations. And not just multinational corporations, there's a factory there that's putting in, you know, that's taking bottled water out of the Colorado River and bottling it. And as an aside, we just saw that Donald Trump uh, took the Obama regular era regulation concerning the limitations on using plastic bottles and has just done away with them. So that uh, we are now in the age of the return of the plastic bottle, though we know how damaging uh, and exploitative it is to our environment and therefore to us. Is that the real concern, to summarize, is that the real concern here is the kind of exploitation and using up of nature that large corporations engage in that are not only on the river, like the factory I talked about, but who also are in cities and in corporate agriculture. And I, I think we can make a general point here that using nature for profit is something that we should look at very carefully. I think we would reverse engineer it from the profits that are being generated from nature. And those would be the sorts of moments because you truly are simply draining nature and converting it into your own self interests. Those would be the moments when we would look at that and reverse engineer it from the amount of profit that is being made and say, this is where nature equal the playing field is going to have to have some rights and standing to show that what you're doing to it is unsustainable. So who gets to decide what is in the uh, the interest of the river? And I'm thinking about conversations I've had many times with loggers who say, I know what's better for the forest than does some damn environmentalist. And ranchers, I, I had a good friend in my 20s who was a rancher who – we used to fight bitterly about this, and he would he would say, you know, I know better what's well, I know what's better for the land much better than does some city slicker who doesn't know cow pie if he steps in it with his brand new loafers, and so there was this uh, very strong notion that they don't want outsiders telling them what to do. So so that's the the hyperbolic part, and the real part is who actually does get to decide. What is in the river's best interest? Interesting. <clears throat> well, you know, I, I don't automatically side with the city slicker when it comes down to, you know, people uh, who actually live in rural America thinking that they know more than city slickers do about it. And I actually understand that, you know, I wouldn't want uh, somebody who's never been to a piece of land or, uh, you know, around a natural entity that I spent my life around coming in and trying to define that relationship for me. And telling me how I can act and telling me what I can't do. So I respect that. But <clears throat> it's this would not be simply somebody who uh, puts themselves in the steed of nature and says, I'm the guy, I'm the person, I know what's best for nature, you do not. What's best for nature, and we define this in the complaint, is it's, you know, are the rights that we describe. Which are the, in the same way, it's like, in the same way that the rights of men that are enumerated in the Bill of Rights are, tend to be pretty good descriptions when realized of what it is to have the opportunity to be a full human being. Well, nature has a right to flourish. Nature has a right to exist. These things are, you know, objectively quantifiable. Is the Colorado, is, are the current demands on the Colorado River being, uh, are they, are they unsustainable uh, or, you know, or are things going along or, you know, in some other world, you know, there could be a Colorado River that is being respected and that is actually is actually flourishing and existing as are all of the uh, biological systems that depend on. So it's not just going to be some person who, you know, may be having a bad day and say, well, I'm going to sue those guys over there because, you know, I don't like the looks of them. And I and I got this job protecting the river. That's, that ain't going to happen. There is in the complaint that anybody would have to generate, they would have to first off prove that they share the values um, that respect and uh, whatever natural entity is at stake here. And that also is that they share objective values and have the kind of expertise to know when uh, an activity is occurring that is actually causing a direct injury to the river Ver versus someone simply saying that like, I don't like what's being done. 
So all of these things that we're talking about here, and the reason that we want to get standing and have some basic rights conferred on the river is because we need to equal this relationship. And I think in equal, equaling the relationship, what we're going to get is a, a reshifting, a paradigm shift, where I actually believe that the people in rural America, they want this. They want an equal playing field. I mean, they are the reason that they're often driven to the brink is because corporations came in and bought the land next to them and are suing them because some seeds flew into their property. Uh, and the kind of competition that exists out there is putting them in a place where they have to manically exploit any resources that, that's available to them. So if all of a sudden you had an equaling of the playing field by granting some rights so that you just couldn't randomly um, – incur injury and deprivation and drain the river and other natural resources, that would be applicable to everyone. And so we would have uh, kind of a, a result with regard to the way that a lot of the activities uh, that depend on the river, uh, mainly thinking of agricultural agriculture here, are done. So there's this, uh, things are objectively verifiable as to what works and fits for the right of the river to exist and flourish. These aren't arbitrary, subjective things based upon whomever, you know, whomever is put in the, in the profound responsibility of having this role of being a fiduciary to the river, whatever person or entity. So who, who, how do we choose who gets to, why should DGR be allowed to be friends to the river in this case? And, um, how I mean, there, there's a process that has gone through before someone can be a a guardian ad litem. You yeah. You, so so what would be the process? Let let's say that you are successful in this and that it moves forward. What would be the process in the future for someone to declare themselves friend of the Adirondacks or friend of the Mississippi River? Mm. So what would be what would be the mechanism by which that status would be conferred on them? Yeah, as opposed to somebody from the Corps of Engineers declaring they're a friend of the river and they want to put well, in I mean, more is, I mean, the law is really here for the, 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 the law is already there with these kind of qualifications. It's like the same thing of like when an expert witness goes into trial. And somebody wants to be an expert witness on a certain area. So for, say, for example, in the J-20 prosecutions uh, that are occurring in D.C. right now where I represent some of the defendants there is in those prosecutions, that's where more than 200 people are being charged and facing more than 75 years in prison each for a couple of broken windows on inauguration day. Um, you have We have an expert. Uh, the government uh, says that the reason that people wear black masks is to create anonymity. And that's what, that's what Antifa and Black Lock are. Well, we have an expert who has written for the nation uh, and, and specializes in dissent, protest, and policing in America, who is going to, who, once he is qualified, will say no. The reason people wear masks is because there's been an increased use in chemical agents as a way to chill and deter protest in America. And for him to be able to say that, we have to go through an entire process called voir dire, me asking him and where I have to turn over to the state or the government in this case, uh, his CV, his information, all of his writings, everything he's done that substantiates that he uh, is an expert to be able to speak in this field. And the court sits back, and the court says, after we go through this voir dire, that's what it's called, expert qualification, uh, and the, the judge says, okay, I've heard all of this, and I'm going to decree that you are an expert in this area. And I see it as very, as very similar to being the same kind of mechanism and qualification processes. Great. Well, that, so that's, that's good. That's one concern we don't have. So here's, a, here's, a, here's another concern, which is that, um, I, I understand you're talking about leveling the playing field, and that's very, very important. And that doesn't alter the fact that if 120% of the Colorado River is allocated, and if the Colorado River is given the legal right to once again reach the ocean and to flourish, we can presume that some of that water will no longer be removed, which is going to mean that... Uh, some golf courses are not going to be watered and or. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Go so, ahead. 
So this just, is a, this is a problem. I, I'm you know, just you, responding to the to the tragedy of a couple of golf courses being eliminated because they don't have enough water. But please. Well, yes. Continue. Let's just mention, by the way, in case people don't know this, that the same amount of water is used by municipal golf courses as is used by municipal human beings. But okay. So having set that aside, I know <laughs> that in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, this was a huge impediment to the abolition of slavery. Was that there were analyses done of the the economic value of these enslaved persons and in order to uh, compensate the slave owners for their uh, quote property uh, that would have bankrupted th th there was not enough money to, to do that and so the point I'm getting at is that if the Colorado River gains some of these abilities, there are people who are going to lose a lot of money. And there are some farmers who won't be able to. I saw this 60 Minutes several years ago on um, on the Sacramento River being drained. And they actually said in there, they had, they, sympathetically, they said of farmers, the thing was terrible, of farmers, they said, these people are creating life. And the people who want to keep the water in the river are creating death because it would kill the almond trees. <laughs> and so so leaving aside that propaganda, the fact is, if the water stays in the river, somebody's not going to get it. So 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 that's it. So so go. Okay, so somebody's not going to get it. Well, okay. Again, let's just get back to objective criteria. Now, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's science shows that cattle ranching, for example, it's really not a very sustainable activity. I mean, I don't know. Do you happen to know, like, how much water goes into producing a pound of beef? No, but I can tell you George Werthner does. If you want to contact him at some point, I can put you in contact. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's an incredible amount. And it's a very wasteful amount. And so, you know, this is America today where, you know, being a good American is not questioning the status quo. So I guess I'm a bad American, Derek. In that, uh, I think some activities simply have to be questioned. Uh, no, you don't get a golf course. Screw you. You don't get to live that way when it means that other people and nature are being hurt by your activity. So you don't miss, so you don't get a golf course. Uh, make some sustainable golf courses or keep the golf courses to a limited number and make them in a way so that they aren't injuring nature and ultimately because nature is being deprived, injured, injuring human beings and other biological systems. So there are some things that aren't good, and scientifically speaking. As now going back to what I was saying about how this could change behaviors because the river would become a natural entity with rights and standing, it would change those behaviors for everyone. So that the idea of a corporation, and Nestle is one that I've kept an eye on for some time, of being able to go to the river, we all have water already, and we're thankful for it. Um, but so we really don't need Nestle to go to an already overdrawn river with plastic bottles and start draining the river in order to make as much money as they can, while also you know sometimes they drain the river and then also damaging the environment by putting more plastic into it, which and we are already way past our carrying capacity on plastic. So uh, those kinds of that kind of behavior, because the river would have its rights, the river would be able to sue back if you unnecessarily drained it and injured its right to exist and flourish just to make you and your you know friends on the board a buck, then that would have to be stopped. And good, let's you know there's no reason to hide the ball here. That's why we're doing it. And so the ridiculous wastes of precious natural entities. Um, they're not allowed to stand. No pun intended, you know, standing. But it's it, we can't, some things must end. And that kind of greed and exploitation, I mean, it, it, needs, it, it needs to end in general in this world. But conferring uh, standing and rights upon in any like the Colorado River would take would be a, a real strong step in, in ending what is unnecessary and is really consigning all of us to a very bleak future. So I, I completely agree with everything you're saying and agree with the, 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 the notion that nature has rights. 
it seems to me, and, and this should have been from the beginning, but it, it seems to me that in some ways what what you're doing is it, it seems to me that the law is about at least 120 years behind history because, you know, Frederick Turner wrote that very important essay about the closing of the frontier back in the, what, 1890s? And, yes. Um, everything you're talking about seems to me to be about moving from a frontier mentality to a, a, an inhabitory mentality. Does it, is that making sense? Sure, I guess. Sure. I mean, I, I view it as, okay, so here's how I view this. Is whenever I go camping in the Rockies, there's two types of people who go camp, who like are out in nature. What, the first group are the ones with like, uh, you know, the four wheeler ATVs. And, you know, who are, and, you know, and, and to go glamping out of the back of their car and then, you know, and then are there and then take the ATVs or whatever instrument they're, they're using and go off trail and do whatever they want. That group is the frontier mentality because it has what nature for them is something to be dominated. All right. It's, it's the same old, it's the same old property. We own you. We can do whatever we want with you. Uh, God is with us. God's country. God will fix it all. Uh, nature is, uh, is ours. So let's drive our ATVs over tundra that takes, you know, 200 years to form. <laughs> and then who cares? And then, you know, and leave our beer cans around there. That's one. That's the frontier mentality. That's domination. The mentality that we're talking about is more alive. And it's, have, it's about, you know, the people who go camping and they're very conscious about the environment around them. And they're out there to learn from nature. I didn't get the opportunity to finish what I was talking about, about how some people can only understand things in terms of direct injury to themselves. And you're going to have to talk to them, you know, about, uh, and you're going to have to say, okay, well, here's why when you screw with nature and you hurt nature, this ends up being bad for people. Let me show you how, why that is. You know, when you dump that top, that uh, pest, pesticide in the river, this is what happens. So ultimately you're going to get a big lump in your neck. So, and then all of a sudden they're like, well, wait, I don't want that pesticide drop in the river. <clears throat> but the group I like the most <laughs> are the people who have actually spent a lot of time in nature in the integrative model. And who believe it, who are just overwhelmed by its power and its beauty, its poetry, and all the amazing things that it has to teach us. So and I, don't, I don't imagine that this argument will be too hard to make to them. And so, you know, part of this is that, it, in, you know, we have to, to the one group, which is the mass uh, group of a group of Americans who would see this, they have to be, they have to explain, they have to be explained how this could be an injury to nature is an injury to them. And also, I think they understand what I would amount to, like the Bernie Sanders argument that, you know, we got to equal the playing field between corporations and nature, or they're just going to be any nature left by the time it's all said and done. But then there's also this component, this third group, and I think probably we're in this group. And I'm proud to be in it, where we just simply understand the dynamic power and that nature is in some way, it's, it is our spirit. It is, you know, I, I believe that nature is its own kind of God in a way, and that it is as important and as alive and as beautiful and as dynamic as, well, probably more dynamic than most human beings I know, but at least as, as, as many human beings. And that it needs to be respected. And that the systems that exist within it are the same systems that exist within us. Um, so it's those people, going back to this, it's, that's, it's a transfer to beginning to respect nature rather than simply seeking to dominate it and use it up, which is the transference from uh, the frontier mentality to in a more... Uh, Inhabited, inhabitable, or uh, integrative mentality that you were talking about. So you're running up against this notion of nature as property, and specifically when you take on the Colorado River as opposed to some other uh, natural being, um, you're also running up against Western water law and a lot of established law there and for people who don't know and I'm sure you know this much better than I do but western water western united states water law is the phrase is first in time first in right mm -hmm. and what that means is the first people who showed up and took water from the river 
to use for what they call, quote, beneficial uses, uh, get to maintain that right. So somebody comes and they can take a million acre feet from the Colorado River to use to irrigate their alfalfa field or to run their mine, then since they were the first one there to claim it, they get to claim it. And the, 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 the point here is that, uh, three points. One point is that um, the tradition, the, the human beings who are traditionally, who are living along the river, they did not count as beneficial uses. They're, they're you know, drinking of, of it or catching salmon or whatever. And second, the use of the fish and the use of the river, I mean, the, the use by the fish of the river and the use by the trees of the river, those are not recognized as beneficial uses either. And the third point, and this is the real point and this is the question, is not only are you demanding that rivers be ha have a legal standing, but you're also specifically going up against, what is it, 150 years of Western water law? So is that is that a concern or is that a problem or is that a, a I mean that's certainly a challenge. So so that's 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 all. I don't I don't really just take it from wherever you want from that. Yeah, it's a challenge. <clears throat> it's absolutely a challenge. And it's not if it's a water law. And let me tell you something: is that an attorney would be a fool unless they're a real expert in water law to really explore that area. It's a it's its own kind of. I, I'm familiar with the basic tenets that drive it, but uh, that kind of litigation is its own complex set. So, but w what I can speak to him more is in a more legally philosophical way, is that what water law derives from is the idea of nature as property. And as proper and pro property, what that derives from, obviously, is this idea of the discrete legal unit that cannot be trespassed against. And in able to cognize a trespass, you have to have standing or personhood. So that's in an interesting way is that you can think about this suit as saying that we are, we are giving the right of nature to nature to not be trespassed against. So <clears throat> I think that is a way perhaps that people can understand that in the way that perhaps you have property, nature in its, uh, that cannot be trespassed against, and the way that you cannot be trespassed against, we would call that an assault or a battery or intentional infliction, emotional distress, something like that. Um, nature has, in its, because it's its own sensitive system and that can, and that it can, it can die and it can be drained and it can suffer in this in very many of the same ways that other natural entities including us suffer and that is it can become sick it can become toxic it can stop to function and the creatures within it will then you know become sick toxic and stop functioning is so that what we're saying is that you cannot trespass against natural entities and so that grounds us Derek in the history of Western law. Okay, so that's the Western law. Now, where it could get really interesting and funky. And, you know, this is, uh, this, this mountain, I doubt this mountain is going to be climbed anytime soon in America. But with that said, it's been climbed in India, Ecuador, and Colombia. Is that nature unto itself is, well, no, I think I'm going to stop there because I've learned to stop at a certain place when I, I, I I've said what I think I needed to say. So yeah, it seems it seems. Um, I mean, I just said a moment ago that you're going against 120 years of Western yeah. water law, and you just said that you're going against Western property law, which what goes back a thousand years. That's right. So it goes back. So it goes back a thousand years. So and going back to the mountain that's going to be very difficult, difficult to climb is that it's that this mountain is that the concept of property, which serves as the cornerstone of Western law that was, you know, codified, you know, in the Magna Carta is that which gives rise to which gives rise to this gross disproportional power relationship between corporations and people and entities and nature that exists today because nature is viewed as something that has standing, standing that can be trespassed against. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, when, when I put it in those terms, it seems pretty daunting. And so I want to get back to something that we talked about last time, which is the procedural defect. 
It is. Uh, as we discussed last time, it's that this idea that, okay, is that the courts don't really want to be silent in matters that they know are damaging and not only just in damaging people and just simply damaging. And so it's like the courts are just completely silent as it is this huge area. So they're almost helpless in the realm of global warming. I mean, ju judges are intelligent. They read, they look at things and they read about the extinctions that are occurring and they read about and understand that we, you know, the planet is warming and are seeing what's happening, the intensification of hurricanes. But for, ex but the courts, because of this kind of standing requirement where you, uh, you have to show direct injury to a human being, in cases that have come to them to this point, they have had just to simply dismiss them and be silent and have no voice. And so what I, and because of this procedural defect that nature doesn't have standing. So instead of taking back, and I'm kind of thinking through this as I go, and this is good, instead of going back and saying, well, we need to overturn or, you know, shape shift a bit, you know, our fundamental conception of property law, which is at the basis of all of Western law from the Magna Carta forward. It may be just easier to characterize this as a procedural defect because that's what it is in addressing the procedural defect. So the courts will have a voice in being able to address the most relevant injustices of our time, which are occurring within the environment. And it seems also that one of the, one of the things that will be really fortuitous is if at some point, uh, a judge can be found who has the courage of, I can't remember his name right now, but the British Lord who abolished, um, abolished slavery with, uh, in the, in the UK with, uh, the ruling that we must do what's right, even though, um, the heavens may fall. Yeah. May justice come though the heavens fall. Is, uh, I think mean, that's, uh, First words of that are Ruit, Callum, something, something. I can't remember the rest. <laughs> yeah, and and so, and I think you know it is daunting, and of course all of our work is daunting, but um, I keep thinking, and this is corny as hell, but I keep thinking about a a slogan that was on my locker room wall in college, the the athletic wall, which is "Luck is where preparation meets opportunity," and you know you can't. Things may be daunting, but you have to, you have to do them, and then and then sometimes they fail, and then you do them again, and sometimes they fail until at some point they don't fail. Yeah, I mean, I, and I and I think in the law, one of the strategies also is to introduce important legal concepts like the rights of nature in a way that the court can understand them and cognize them. And give the court, and it, you know, the court is like its own sort of thinking brain. You know, the first time it hears, it hears something, it seems strange. But maybe by the tenth time it hears something and sees something, it begins to make a ton of sense. I mean, there is in the, you know, in the animal rights law, I, I don't know their names, but there are people, you know, who have really taken it upon themselves to file complaint after complaint regarding the rights of, say, a chimpanzee to bring suit. Stephen Wise. Stephen Wise. Amazing guy. Amazing guy. And so that's, you know, so he's done that. And, you know, the first couple of times he did it, he was nowhere. Probably laughed out of court. He was probably saying he might have even been sanctioned. I'm sure this is what we talked about last time is in these situations. And this is especially relevant for us. I mean, because, uh, you know, corporations, you know, they exploit nature for profit. It's, there's this dependency. I've always wondered, and I heard about this, Derek, and I bet you know, is that how much there's, is it possible to quantify how much nature contributes to the economy? Well, the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing. The whole thing. Because <laughs> without without nature, you have no economy. That's right. Okay. You don't have any so life. Nature, right. So you have no economy. You, you don't have you, without nature. You have no economy. Okay. Well, uh, that sounds like something I can go with. Is uh, so. I'm sorry. We'll have to step back and think about what I was saying. If, if you can recall, and kind of get us back online. Um, you were asking me the amount. Uh, Stephen Wise. Uh, that's right. So, okay, that's right. So back to Stephen Wise and the efforts that he's done is that, so in our case, and this goes back to what I was saying with corporations, is that because they, because nature is the economy and they depend and exploit nature for everything, is that when you file something like this, they're going to come back at us hard. 
Um, and, you know, and I know what the case with Thomas, uh, they had filed a, a simply an intervener motion in uh, a case that was happening in Pennsylvania several years ago. They tried to cognize some basic natural and community rights. And that's Thomas Lindsay of Seldev. Um, uh, I think I forget the corporation was it was an energy corporation and they came back and I'm trying to get attorney's fees and do everything. I call it there's a word for it. I call it Chevron. Uh, a colleague of mine, Stephen Donziger, uh, went down to Ecuador. Uh, and Stephen is a really good friend. And he goes down to Ecuador and, you know, he had the freaking temerity to try to say, OK, hey, look, Chevron, you cannot uh, pollute um, the lands of indigenous people uh, to the point where it becomes unlivable. And these people are dying because of what you're doing. These people have value and worth as well. And so he went down there and he, and he had the guts to fight Chevron. And actually, he was fairly effective, more than fairly effective. And in response, and this is what I mean by Chevron, the Chevron is now seeking $32 million against him in, in attorney's fees and trying to get him disbarred. So that's what happens when, you know, you, you uh, go up against the system and the entrenched forces and you are effective. So, you know, we can only hope that, uh, for me, I word as a badge of honor, the harder they come back, it means the more effective and uh, we're being and the more scared they are that we, we might actually do something that, like I said, equals the playing field. So we have about five or six minutes left, and this is not the question I want to end with, but it is it is one that I, I think, I'll, especially those who disagree with this will ask, is is so if if, if the Colorado River is granted rights, um, okay, I'll grant you that, but where do you stop? Um, do And then Stephen Wise has addressed this question himself, that he, he agrees that all of nature should have rights, but he himself has carved out. He's going to do it step by step. He's starting with great apes, and then he's going to move from there to cetaceans. And I don't know if he's already doing cetaceans. But anyway, great apes, cetaceans, and then move to monkeys, and then just do it. You know, eat eat, eat them eat the monster one bite at a time. And sure. So that's that's great. That's one great approach. But what do you do about somebody who says, "Well, do viruses have rights? Does the smallpox virus have a right to exist?" I don't know. Those kinds of questions are just ridiculous. Is that you know, there, there are, like I said, there are objectively quantifiable ways of uh, saying, you know, looking at the complexity of a system, um, looking at, you know, and, the, and this is interesting, is that human beings aren't, you know, out of this picture in this quantification and looking at, okay, what should have rights? Where should the rights stop? It's like, to what degree do human beings depend on it? That's a, it's another value and another question. And so these kind of, these sorts of things like, well, you know, you're, you're committing genocide because you killed 100 million bacteria by moving the coffee cup from here to here on the kitchen sink. These are just absurdities that, you know, that, that are about as persuasive as, you know, the 3 a.m. wine field comment when someone's just trying to be smart. I don't, uh, and, and, and I'm the one who's usually trying to make those comments, by the way, is that I, I don't, um, you know, it's very easy to get real smart and to make good judgments and to find real solutions as to what should have rights and what shouldn't. You know, like, for example, is that I am always in this conundrum. Is I really like spiders. Spiders are amazing. And they're beautiful, and they're highly complex creatures who do amazing things. But I'm always scared that the spider is going to, it might be a poisonous spider. So I'm always kind of in this place where I'm wondering if I should endure and respect the right of a spider to put up a nice little web in my house. Now, that doesn't really answer the question or anything like that, but I'm, I'm always interested in people, how people integrate with uh, some of the bugs that come into their into their home, um, and, you know, I guess some people automatically say, "Well, you just kill them," because there's no comparison. But for me, I find it enjoyable to contemplate the spider and contemplate whether or not it's it's possible for us to have a, re a relationship. And uh, based on the spider web that's on uh, by my ceiling that I can see from right here, um, it's working out so far. <laughs> and and a yeah, there's spider webs all, all over here too. I, I completely agree with you. And yes. B, for myself, um, I think the question for me is, is not quite so much whether the individual fish, uh, would have necessarily rights, but specifically the larger fish community. And for me, that's how I would get around the whole smallpox question is that I love this line by, oh, the, um, shoot, the, uh, the mushroom guy, um, Paul Stamets. He says, nature loves a community. 
And for me, uh, once again, this is irrelevant. I don't know if it's irrelevant or not, but I'm more interested in the Colorado River community as a larger entity and that having rights than I am on any individual within that community. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, well, what, I think what you're saying is that when you look at the collective and, and included in the collective is nature, then that then the, then the concept of what rights are can change a little bit. Um, you know, it's like I think it's important to add here that I think there's been this kind of false dynamic that's been created. Like, well, if you were for the environment, then you're against people. Um, I don't see it that way at all. I mean, the reason I'm very interested in the environment is because I'm also very interested in people. And I, I see that I see them go, as going hand in hand. So as part of the greater calculus of all this is also the human community and community rights. So this what all of this really ends up being is just empowering the relationships between all of us and all of us includes nature so that we can uh, plan on being here a little bit longer than it looks like we're going to be here right now. So last time I ended by asking you about how people who live elsewhere can uh, can can either assist in your efforts or do efforts on their own. And this time I'm going to ask the same question but in a different subset, which is um, there are a lot of young people I know who want to become attorneys to defend nature. And what, A, advice can you give them, and B, um, how can they best help nature, do you think? Uh, I would say first, don't do it. It's a, the, the attorney existence, uh, I'm being very frank here, and I probably have one of the best attorney existences uh, that you can carve out for yourself. And being a civil rights attorney who takes uh, very interesting cases that are usually at the forefront of social issues and, you know, and doing this kind of, and, and then be able to make enough money to survive while doing that and take on things like this. But one of the things I didn't calculate in doing this is that when you become attorney, it means you believe in that you've got to believe in the system to a degree. You've got to take the system seriously. Uh, you've got to interact. You, you know, it's being a lawyer is being enmeshed. It's being a cog in the system. And, you know, and you can say, well, you know, you can challenge the system. And that, that's what we're doing here from certain angles. But at the end of the day, it's like we've been saying during the last few conversations is you've got to put all of this. You've got to all put all this into the language of the system. You've got to all make, got to have to have it make sense for the system so that ultimately or, or otherwise the system will just penalize and ignore you both or both. So that ultimately, being a lawyer, you are part of the system. And I'm going to be real honest with you, is that my biggest questions about this entire thing is I, I actually love people. And I love nature, and I have a pretty good time in my life. But um, one of the things that's really starting to haunt me now is that this system just isn't working. And it's uh, it's it's cashing us out, and it's taking us to a place that we're not going to come back from. And I mean, it's politically, environmentally, the whole thing. We're not in a good place. And so one of the things that sometimes I wish is that uh, I sometimes wish that, uh, you know, I didn't have this attorney thing with me because I'm aware of the fact that I'm able to do a lot of good with it. But sometimes I myself feel limited in the sorts of things, uh, the way that I can talk about things and the sorts of um, things that I can do is that, you know, I believe uh, in the right and just cause of civil disobedience when necessary. Um and like for, for the right just cause and to preserve nature and to hinder exploitation of nature and other human beings. But as an attorney for, you know, that's, that requires at times breaking the law so that, you know, so I'm not allowed to encourage or participate in that endeavor. And a, a big part of me really wonders if systemic solutions can really even do this anymore. So that's the kind of thing that I sit on. So while I, so while I'm writing out the motions and going to my law office and, living this life and doing this career, there's a kind of this thing that hangs with me saying, are you contributing? Uh, you know, by creating the illusion of a functioning system, by creating the illusion and the veneer of due process, by creating the illusion of veneer of justice, because sometimes I worry that that's what I'm really doing and not actually really achieving any of those things. Yeah, I completely hear you. And I feel the same about writing. One of my most famous lines is, every morning when I wake up, I ask myself whether I should write or blow up a dam. And yeah. 
that's, that's yes. sort of, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's what, you know, writing, writing is good, writing is important. Uh, and, but, you know, all of these, but these are all institutional systemic things. There are things that ultimately, you know, it's, it's, you know, I wonder about, you know, say you write the most brilliant piece on the environment for the New Yorker or something, or wherever it's going to come out, wherever. You know, it, it's at the end of the day, just because of the medium, it ends up being something more along the lines of liberal entertainment rather than, it's, no, put it this way, and I hope you understand that I'm just talking about writing itself, is, uh, you're writing, Derek, I have a tremendous amount of respect for, because uh, with your writing, it has an, it has an organizational reach, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, an outreach quality to it, where you are craft, using words to craft a possible response and way of being that could actually solve some of these problems. That's a slightly different, you're, you're engaged in a lifelong call to resistance, I think it's fair to say. Well, I think, and, go ahead, I'm what? sorry. And so that's, that's a little different than saying, like, you know, writing educating or educated articles that end up just being, you know, intelligent entertainment. But re- suffice it to say, regardless, that none of that, none of these things and none of these endeavors are actually, like you said, going out and, you know, and uh, in the tradition of Edward Abbey, uh, stepping up and saying this far, no further. So, and I wonder very, very personally, if, you know, if I'm just creating a veneer in this role or if, um, if really that I should be doing other and different things that might have, might have a real impact. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, we just do the best we can. Well, thank you so much for all that. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Jason Flores Williams. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on Progressive Radio Network.